On Nationwide this evening, this week 100 years ago, the guns were raging on the Western Front and some of the fiercest battles of the First World War were being fought. Guest presenter Brian Dobson travels to the Somme to bring us the stories of the Irish who fought and died there. Now, one joke which went before the 16th Irish Division, before they were given the orders to go towards Guillemont, was that everybody will receive a cross. Now, whether it's military or wooden depends on your luck. An existence that is hard to conjecture today. I don't think that today's generation could survive it. It's amazing to me that we did, in at least those of us who did. The screaming, the terror, the fear, and you're still running, you're still walking. What's, what's going through your mind? Utter panic. You kill them or they kill you one or the other. What the hell? It was just a game. You kill or be killed. I've sat down on the, on the wall down there in the evening when the sun's gone down, and I think to myself, how many men saw that sunset as well? And it was their last one. The Battle of the Somme lasted 141 days, and the scale of casualties was enormous, even by the standards of the First World War. In that short period of time, more than a million men were killed or wounded. This is the largest memorial to the fallen on the Western Front, and it contains the names of thousands of Irishmen, from Cork to Donegal, from Belfast to Waterford. It was the summer of 1916. The British planned to force a huge German retreat along the River Somme in northern France. On July the 1st, naively thinking they had shelled the enemy into submission with an unprecedented barrage, British commanders sent 100,000 men over the top. By late afternoon, 60,000 of those men were killed or wounded. The Somme was becoming the most disastrous day in the history of the British Army. It's a sunny, hot morning. You've got up and down the British line, 125,000 infantry waiting to advance against the German lines. They've been told that everything is going to go to plan. They've been told that nothing is going to stand in their way. There's a sense of buoyancy, which has filtered down throughout the battalions. But even though the British barrage has been going on for some period of time before that, what they don't know is that actually there's no lines cut in the wire ahead of them. So many of these men, as they actually advance towards their own line and to their own British wire, actually get massacred before they even leave the British zone and before they even actually get to the German zone. The British bombardment had failed and the Germans were waiting and well prepared. Well, that's the terrible thing. I mean, there are so many accounts of, um, for example, R Colonel Ricardo talking about his um, in the Skilling Fusiliers marching off as if they were on parade ground. Um, the Tyneside Irish, with their, uh, their, their weapons shouldered with the bayonets fixed on them, walking across. And of course, the Tyneside Irish get massacred before they've gone 100 yards. So, I mean, the Germans almost cannot believe that they have this, as they say at the time, visible target approaching them. And one Belfast rifleman once recalled that effectively it was like watching water coming out of a spout, the amount of machine gun bullets which are flying across. And you can't imagine the volume of fire that the Germans were able to, to pour down upon the Irish and Ulster troops that day. This battle was over within hours of its beginning. Men from the 36th Ulster Division and the 16th Irish Division from the south were to the fore of the slaughter. Some 7,000 of these Irishmen became casualties in less than 10 hours. For Tom Burke, revisiting the Somme is a very personal journey, one he has made many times. The silence is eerie, Brian, at, at, at this moment of time, uh, 100 years later, um, but there was that silence. The, the, the 7.30 in the morning was zero, zero. So moments, seconds beforehand, men waited and looked at each other waited with sweat, fear, P 
heed literally with anxiety in their own pants, God loves them, and waited for that moment to go. And when the whistle went, you had to go. If you didn't go, you were going to face a court martial. But it happened, I mean, how quickly w would the troops coming out of these trenches have realised that the, the plan had gone very seriously Within wrong? seconds, Brian, um, because Although the commander Rawlinson was, he told them, all you have to do, chaps, is literally walk. Don't run. Don't run. You, you, can, you can walk across the German lines. And you can imagine yourself getting over this trench and seeing your mate, you know, his head blown off, his arm blown off, the screaming, the terror, the fear, and you're still running. You're still walking. I know what's, what's going through your mind. Utter panic. Primarily, the, the, the main casualties from, from an Irish perspective, in fairness, what came from the Ulster Division. Parts of Ulster were completely decimated with grief, little villages, hamlets and town all across Ulster. But beside them was the 29th Division, and even beside them, and again further, was the 4th Division. It, it, it came down really just between you and your mate, the guy beside you, to look after and to say, you know, will we get through this? And many of them sadly didn't. You know, one wonders how the, how the generals maintained discipline after that. I mean, how when the next they time they ordered the troops over the top, they obeyed the order. They did. They had no choice, Brian. I mean, and again, this comes down to the sense of morale and comradeship and, uh, and, and the, the, these concepts of these PALS battalions. The Ultra Division was a classic PALS battalion. Rugby players joined up together, tennis players, men from factories joined up together. So there was this inter-community and so that was one of the great tragedies of that song, particularly with the Ulster Division, that it wiped out entire communities. 19,500 men dead in one day. Both Irish divisions had huge losses. Men who had survived Gallipoli were now dying in huge numbers on a single day. The Ulster Division advanced further than expected, only to be forced to retreat. Five and a half thousand of them killed or wounded. Such was the ferocity of the German response, and night hadn't even fallen. Their memorial is at Tiapval Wood. So Teddy, what's the significance of this spot? Why this memorial is here? Well, we're walking up the German side of no man's land, uh, the British side of no man's land, you could say, was the other side of the road. Mm -hmm. Back towards uh, the wood here. Back towards the wood. Mm -hmm. And we're actually walking towards the German front line. And the scale of the casualties, Teddy, was, was just 5, shattering, five, wasn't it? 5,500. Dead and wounded. And dead and wounded. Killed, wounded and missing. Mm -hmm. 2,200 confirmed dead on the 1st of July. Out of an attacking force, I reckon around about eight and a half thousand. But there wasn't a town or a village or a street that wasn't affected by what happened here on the 1st of July. And in the Battle of the Somme, not just, not just in, in, in our province, all over Ireland was exactly the same. You have men from all over Ireland, from every town and village in Ireland, fighting here during the Battle of the Somme. So the impact north and south during the Battle of the Somme absolutely horrendous. Uh, there's another cemetery not far from here and in one row there is a young fella and three rows back is his father, 56 years of age. And that's not very far from here. And in fact this tower, Teddy, was built very soon after the end of hostilities, isn't that right? The tower was built and dedicated in time for the dedication in 1921. The tower is very special. The tower is a replica. Uh, if you go into Clandyboy Estate, between Newton Ards and Bangor, you'll find exactly the same. This is our national memorial. The Ulster Tower is our national memorial. But we also uh, remember the sacrifice of all the men in Ireland, not just, not just our own problems. We're all fighting under the same flag in 1916. Ireland's all won in 1916. And then 1922, we became separated. The Battle of the Somme dragged on and on. Despite the attack on the first day, only three square miles of the front had been taken. Even battle-hardened soldiers of the Irish Division found their experiences appalling, as summer turned to autumn and then to winter. And I began to get sick into my gas mask, you know. Then my ears began to pain me, and I began to find it difficult to breathe. So I'd rather pull the blast plastic thing off or, or suffocate. So I pulled it off, of course, scattered around for a while and went down. 
luckily a lad came along and I just sort of went down and he said, well, where are you hit, mate? So I said, I'm not hit, I'm certain gassed. And as he bent down to uh, help me, he said, no wonder you're gassed, mate. He said, there's a big piece of German shell in the metal container of your gas mask. That's what hit me early on the day. The town of Albert lies in the heart of the Somme battle region. It was destroyed and its history is defined by the battle to this day. Beneath its streets is a warren of tunnels where locals sheltered from the war around them. It's now a museum to the events of 1916. Well, all the villages uh, in this uh, area, they were absolutely obliterated. There was nothing, nothing, nothing left. We can see afterwards uh, a few pictures, for example, of villages just before the bombardment, during and after. There was absolutely nothing, nothing left anymore. Just after, what people just wanted to forget about it. Uh, for example, uh, uh, when they started to clean up, they threw in everything in trenches, large shell holes, covered it up with earth, and it's clean. But nowadays, uh, still, uh, when they plow the fields, everything starts to come up. Rifles, helmets, ammunition, and even sometimes still soldiers are coming up. Join us in part two as we hear more of the tragic stories of those sacrificed at the Somme. It was near the villages of Guillemont and Ganchy that the Irish division met its strongest resistance. But both places were key strategic locations and commanders pushed hard to have them taken. Today, there are just farms and some small reminders of the past. Tom, this is the only memorial, I think it's true to say, to the 16th Irish Division on the Somme. It's, 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 the little, it's a small little memorial and there are interesting features about it, I think. I mean, it has the words, Do cum gloria dia agus anorna heron to the glory and God of the honour of Ireland. And here's this little town in northern France where these Irish words are spoken, Oscailge, in memory of thousands. And the objective, Tom, set for the 16th Irish Division to take these two villages was met. They succeeded, but at a huge cost in terms of, of casualties of dead and injured. I mean, we could talk all day about the sadness about this thing, but one particular one that, that stood out to me recently was a young called Timothy O'Connor. He's only 17 years of age came from, the, from Gloucester Street, 19 years of age, you know, his mate from, 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 from the North Cir South Circular Road. And this is where the telegrams were coming, to houses uh, with, with, of ordinary, simple Irish people. And the evil that had been unleashed here in September and, and, and on July 1916 penetrated right back to the very heart and soul of Ireland. So in here, Tom, there's another reminder of the Irish connection with this village and this area. This is a little memorial, Brian, that was put up in 2008 to the 16th Irish Division, um, and it shows the battalions, where they came from, who they were, that took the village of Ginchy in on the 8th and 9th of September 1916. You can see the Munster Fusiliers, Dublin Fusiliers, and the Skill and Connacht Rangers from the four corners of Ireland, as we talked about early, earlier on. And what did it cost in terms of casualties, um, missing, uh, yeah. dead and injured, to take these two tiny villages? Absolutely, Brian. I mean, it, it was, it's frightening. You, you cannot ta talk in terms of losses of any Psalm campaign without talking in thousands. And that's really what we're looking at. Four and a half thousand men, Irishmen, from the four corners of Ireland were killed, wounded, disappeared into the dust. Many of them are on the Thiepfel Memorial, other men are buried in little cemeteries whose bodies were never found. Among those men was Lieutenant Tom Kettle, a nationalist MP and the man who wrote one of the best known Irish poems of the war. In To My Daughter Betty, Tom Kettle seeks to explain to his daughter the reasons for his own sacrifice and that of his men. So here, while the mad guns curse overhead, and tired men sigh with mud for couch and floor, know that we fools, now with the foolish dead, died not for flag, nor king, nor emperor, 
but for a dream born in a herdsman's shed and for the secret scripture of the poor. They are unbelievable words, Brian, for any human being in a moment of, of silence, in a moment of, of inner contemplation, to put, to, to put down these words in such in a wonderful way. And not only to tell Betty, but to tell the people of Ireland that I didn't come out here to die for a king or a, a flag or an emperor. I died for a dream. And that dream was to have a peaceful, united Europe, to, have, to identify with the, the scripture of the poor, the weak, the downtrodden. What a noble man, what a loss to our country. In Dublin's St Stephen's Green, there is a little known memorial to Tom Kettle. It was only erected in recent years. For poet Theo Dorgan, Kettle's legacy is more complex than one well-known poem. He did write one very fine poem, certainly the last four lines are marvellous. But he wrote it under the pressure of circumstances, I think. It didn't come out of the study, it was forced out of him by the, um, the obscenity, I suppose, of, of the, the battles he saw. You're the enigmatic last lines, you know, the secret scripture of a dream born in a herdsman's house, the secret scripture of the poor. I mean, it's, it's enigmatic and it's also very unclear, so you can project what you want onto it. Um, but he had a very strong attachment to Dublin, and he had, as a lot of officers at the time, a very sentimental attachment. The men of the sentiment and his care and concern from didn't lead to refraining from leading them to their death. I, I resent it when people try to recruit either the, rise, the, the men of the rising, men and women of the rising indeed, uh, or, and the men of the, of the First World War, to contemporary politics. I think it's, uh, there's something faintly obscene about that because they lived and fought and died in the context of the times. I'm, I'm perfectly happy and I think everybody should be to see Kettle and the men who died on the Western Front remembered for the, their personal honour, but we shouldn't confuse that with the uh, political position. Most of the men who he went back to serve with were offered the choice between starvation in the slums or the King's Shilling, and when you're that poor, it's no choice at all. I like to think, given his previous politics, that it, it, that it was his sympathy for their predicament that brought him back. I think, ultimately, the Somme has been a maligned battle. It was a very necessary battle, and it was a battle that needed to be won. And I think the commanders who were in charge of that battle have possibly also been unfairly maligned. Because it was successful in the military terms that it, it needed to be. It took longer than they thought it was going to take, and it took far more men than ever they thought it was going to take. But it also had a toll on the Germans, and that was the pivotal point. And I think really when you look at the Somme a hundred years later, there are so many different issues you have to, to bear in mind. And you've got to balance it, obviously, with the fact of how many people died and were maimed because of the Somme as well. And Teddy, when people think about the, the scale of the casualties, the loss of life, uh, for such little, uh, in military terms, achieved, they must ask themselves, what was it all about? It's very hard to explain to people uh, why there was such a sacrifice here very, very difficult. And I mean, it, it is very, very difficult to, to explain it even to yourself. You know, why was this, why was this done? I've sat down on the, on the wall down there in the evening when the sun's gone down. And I think to myself, how many men saw that sunset as well? And it was their last one. And I look around and I think, what the devil happened here? You know, it's strange, very, very strange, very strange place. I mean, I think it's very humbling when you go to France and find that there's very little distinction made between the 36th Ulster Division and the 16th Irish Division, beyond the fact that they know the Ulstermen came from the north and were largely Protestant, the, the Irish Division came from the south and were largely Catholic. But as far as they're concerned, the gratitude they have for the Irish soldiers, who they as they consider liberated parts of the Somme, is truly overwhelming. And it's nice to know that they have this affinity with the Irish soldiers who lie in their cemeteries 
And I think it's only fitting that we should have that uh, affinity, and we owe it to them to have that affinity now. Well, Brian, this is the grave of Private Michael Dowling of the 10th Royal Dublin Fusiliers, uh, the same people who were involved in putting down the Easter Rising of April 1916 back in Dublin. He died on the same day as the other Dublin Fusiliers died on 13th of November 1916. He was only 19 years of age. Came from Robertstown, as I say, in County Kildare, and it's probably reasonably safe to assume that not many people visit this young man's grave. And you may notice on his grave, he says, there's a little inscription at the, at the end of it, it says, Thy kingdom come. Uh, now, people were given the choice of, the families were given the choice so, uh, of what kind of wording they would like. It's nice to think that perhaps uh, after 100 years, somebody has come back and said, uh, well, we didn't forget you. The Somme pretty much is defined by the amount of casualties. We look at it today and we think, how on earth could uh, a battle on that scale ever be logically thought? Irish regimental casualties throughout the entire campaign is, is judged at being 6,000 dead alone. And that's, you know, possibly 18 to 25,000 casualties, probably more than that. You know, one joke which went before the 16th Irish Division, before they were given the orders to go towards Gilmon, was that everybody will receive a cross. You know, whether it's military or wooden depends on your luck. The Battle of the Somme finally petered out in the winter's snow and rain. Its chief legacy lay not in the territory that was gained, but in the terrible number of lives that were lost. I thought it was my duty to go out and fight for the right of small nations, which included our own Ireland. If it happened again, I would certainly volunteer again. I go tomorrow. On next Friday's Nationwide, more stories from the First World War as we meet some young Irish students who have researched stories of Irish soldiers who fought and died in the Great War. And you can see live coverage of the international commemoration of the Battle of the Somme on Friday morning from half ten here on RTE1. Next, it's Ear to the Ground.